People are the most dangerous and deadly invasive species in the history of the earth. People are what are going to ultimately kill us all. Wouldn't it be useful to know something about this, this, this predator? Personality psychology is the one formal discipline that's designed, intended, that takes human nature as a, as a subject matter. And the big questions are, you know, what's life all about? Uh, how are people all alike? How are, and how are all people all different in, in significant and, and important ways? Personality psychology was invented as a formal discipline by European uh, psychiatrists in the late 19th century. Famous names would include Freud, Jung, Adler, Erickson, Horney. And they, all they had their differences, they all agreed on one thing. The most important generalization we can make about people is everyone's somewhat neurotic, which means the big problem in life is to overcome your neurosis. The problem with that model is people are not all neurotic and there are bigger problems in life than overcoming your neurosis. That's the first answer. The second answer comes from academic psychology, particularly from a a, a man named Gordon Allport, who was a Harvard, at Harvard in the 1920s and 30s, and he promoted a point of view called trait theory. And according to trait theory, people are all alike in that people all have traits. <laughs> people are all different in that people have different traits. And the big problem in life is to discover your traits. Now this, this is the point of view that uh, prevails in academia. I think it's really simplistic, trivial, empty, circular, and unhelpful. I try to capture the best insights of psychoanalysis with the best insights of sociological role theory. And both points of view argue that uh, people, what people do is mostly unconscious. People mostly don't understand why they're doing what they're doing when they're doing it. In this model, the most important generalization you can make about people is actually three. The first generalization is people always live in groups. That's true. We're the most social animal on earth. People always live in groups. Every group has a status hierarchy, that's true. There are people at the top, people at the bottom, people in the middle. And then the third thing is that, that people, every, every human group has a religion. So this suggests to me, people need attention, approval, and acceptance because they're gonna have to live with other people. They need status, power, and control of resources because the more power or status you have in the group, the better off you're gonna do. And people need structure and predictability in, in their lives. So the big goal, problems in life are getting along, getting ahead, and finding meaning. We do this during social interaction. Social interaction is where the action is. During, we are only alive when we're doing social interaction. The rest of our life concerns getting ready for interaction or reviewing the consequences of the last interaction. Interaction is where the action is. After each interaction, there's an accounting process. People think about you, you think about them. And after every interaction, you gain a little bit of status or you lose a little bit of status. You gain a little bit of respect, you lose a little bit of respect. And over time, those interactions accumulate to turn into your, your reputation, how other people think think about you. In order to get along with other people, we have to give up getting ahead. People resent it if you're successful. In order to get ahead, we have to give up getting along. So there's a, there's a real tension. And then with regard to finding meaning, we all need meaning and purpose and direction in our lives. The problem is there isn't any. So we have to just invent stuff. There's, so there's the you that you know, and then there's the you that we know. And Freud would say, the you that you know is hardly worth knowing, and I would agree because you just made it up. The, your identity, the story you tell yourself about yourself is nothing more than a story. The you that we know is grounded in reality and it's actually uh, very important. Your identity is something that you made up. Your reputation is something that we can confirm amongst ourselves. Personality psychology has historically focused on identity, on the you that you know. 100 years of research on identity have gone nowhere. There's no taxonomy, there's no measurement base, and there are no significant empirical findings to report. We are the folks who, who made the case that personality should be defined in terms of reputation. We have a well-established taxonomy, it's called the five-factor model. We have a, a solid measurement base, Hogan assessments, and we have a cornucopia of findings to report when you talk about personality as reputation. And this, this comes up all the time in our work. We'll, t we'll give someone feedback on their assessments and they'll say, well, that's not how I think about myself. And I, we always just find, well, that's exactly the problem. You, you have basically a, an incorrect and unfounded view of yourself. The real you is the you that we know. So life is about social interaction, and this brings us to the, to the question of, of, of authenticity. I think the whole process of child rearing is about teaching children, preparing children to take part in the big game of life, which involves getting along and getting ahead. The little children are raw bundles of impulse. And what adults have to do, they have to forcibly intervene and, and try to get kids to keep their natural impulses under. They, they want to mess their pants when they feel like it. They yell, they scream, they cry, they roll around on the ground.
If you think about it carefully, the process, the task of socialization, child rearing, is to teach children to be high-functioning hypocrites. That is to deny the person they really are. So there's this question about authenticity. What's, what's, what's authenticity? Well, to be authentic means you would poop on the sidewalk if you felt like it. Children who won't obey adult rules, who won't comply with it, sooner or later society will come in and take over. I always argue the real you, is act the real you, the authentic you, is actually something you should be ashamed of and something you need to <laughs> keep to the side or keep under control. Sincerity is a very carefully constructed act. How do you tell someone you're sincere? You look at them, maintain constant eye contact, you can't let your eyes do some constant eye contact, get a little hitch in your throat, get a little tear in your eye, and you say, this time I really mean it. So at Hogan Assessments, we, we make a really strong distinction between the bright side and the dark side of personality. The bright side of personality is you when you're, beha when, you're you know, when you're keeping your real self under control. It's you when you're a smoothly functioning hypocrite. It's you when you're inter interacting in a smooth and, and positive and productive way with other people. So the bright side refers to <laughs> keeping your natural self under control. Some people, some people have more attractive bright sides than others. That allows them to get along, get ahead, and, and, and have careers in, in, in a productive way. And part of a good bit of what our assessment process does is help people fix uh, flawed bright side behavior. The dark side of personality refers to people's performance, people's interactional style when they're not paying attention, when they let down their guard, when they get distracted, when they're, and so when do, when do we let down our guard? When do we stop maintaining the proper level of hypocrisy? It's when we're tired, when we're bored, when we're distracted, when we're impaired, had too much to drink. But mostly the dark side appears, I think, when people are dealing with people who are their subordinates, when they're dealing with their dog, when they're dealing with their goldfish, when they're dealing with children, they're dealing with people whom they don't respect. In our business, where the dark side matters is in, in the performance of managers, it's career success. And career success inevitably, inevitably involves moving into management roles. The dark side refers to what it is that gets managers fired. We have a taxonomy of the da dark side consists of about 11 dimensions. These are, the, and these are empirically the reason, these are the reasons managers fail. And why do they fail? They're dealing with their subordinates. The dark side comes out because they don't respect their subordinates. An interesting caveat about the dark side is that all the main, the, main, the dark side tendencies that get managers fired, all of them have important positive components to them. So the first dimension that we talk about, we call it excitable. Excitable has to do in its sort of normal range it has to do with working with passion, with fire, with having high standards, with being enthusiastic and driven. But when it slips over into the extremes, it has to do with getting, having so much passion that you begin to yell at people, uh, you become impatient, exasperated with their performance, you, you yell, you walk away, you quit. So the dark side, some elements of the dark, aspects of the dark side are really productive and create you know, positive job performance, but past a certain point they derail people's careers. Dark side emerges when you're dealing with people who have less status than you, and then you start actually being yourself, and enough of that will get you in big trouble as an adult. <laughs>